Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're taking a look at a Skywatcher FlexTube 250P Dobsonian reflector, a popular model for people looking for a mid-sized Dobsonian reflector at the psychologically sensitive $1,000 price point. I get asked about this model all the time and there are a lot of them out there. So let's take a look and see if this telescope might be right for you. Okay, so when you get this telescope, you're probably going to store it like this. You've got the optical tube assembly collapsed down into the rocker box like this. So what you do is, let's take the, the shower cap off the upper truss, and what you do is you loosen these chrome knobs and then pull up on the upper truss assembly. Now when you do this, it can be a little bit sticky, and there are two, one, two click stop positions. When you pull it up, you're gonna be tempted to leave it like this. Do not do that. Take the time to lock these things down because if you don't, it will at some point collapse on you when you least expect it. And I have had at least one case where I've seen where the finder fell off and smashed to the ground and the eyepiece fell off and smashed to the ground. Take the time to close these off. So if you're wondering what this thing is, if you wandered in from YouTube land, we'll get the dust cover off the rocker box here. There's an astronomical telescope designed for looking up at the night sky, and there's a nice big 10-inch mirror back there gathering a lot of light. It deflects the light into this secondary mirror, which deflects the light into this eyepiece. This is where you look. You focus with this knob here. To change magnifications, you change eyepieces. The mount is a Dobsonian mount named after San Francisco astronomer John Dobson, credited with popularizing its design. So here, what we have is an 8x50 right angle finder. I've seen a lot of these. A lot of these telescopes have come through here, and everyone I've seen has had one of these 8x50 right angle finders on them. I haven't seen a straight through finder. The focuser is a Crayford style, and on models that are a few years old, there are rubber grips on, these, on the handles here. Those tend to fall off. Don't worry about that. It happens all the time. I did a review of this model back in 2017 for scope reviews, and at the time I concluded that this was fine for the price. I still feel that way, although it's gone up from $699 to about $1,000. Nothing really to complain about here. It's very well solidly built and designed. One thing I do want to notice, I want you to notice here is the tensioning knobs here is this system where these handles that stick out. And 2017, I said I actually preferred that to the tension arrangement in other Dobsonians like the Orion XT10. I'm walking back on that one a little bit. If you know me well, this is the same tensioning system on my Celestron 12-inch Starhopper, and I find it a little bit frustrating to use. It tends to be a very on-off type of thing, herky-jerky motions. And when you're trying to fine-tune this thing to look through it, it can be a little bit of a hassle. Keep in mind this telescope does not track, so you're going to be moving this thing a lot. Now having said that, the Starhopper is a 12 inch and this is a 10 inch and because it is a little bit lighter, it's not quite as bad as it is on the 12, but I think many of you are going to notice a little bit of stickiness in the motions here. You've got to find just the right tension where things are balanced and not so much that things get very sticky. Like many commercial grade Dobsonians, this one is front heavy. And I'll show you what I mean here. It's not just this one, it's a lot of them. So if you loosen this a little bit too much, this is what happens, okay? And that can happen to you in the dark and you don't want that. What I do on these is I don't particularly care for right angle finders and this thing weighs quite a bit. So I usually take that off and I have a red dot finder here and I can put that on and it weighs substantially less and you'll see there's a little bit less of a tendency for this to come down like this. So that's how that looks. Your choice, finders are a very personal decision. So you know through the years there have been several minor cosmetic variations of these things. This one is the Skywatcher speckled black finish. This looks a lot better in person by the way than it does probably on this video. The new ones appear to be white. The one I had back in 2017 had an optional shroud that covered the truss poles. This one doesn't, and I haven't seen a shroud on one of these in quite some time. Okay, so what do you worry about with a telescope? For example, on an apochromatic refractor, if you have one of those, you worry about it getting damaged or stolen. On a Dobsonian, you tend to worry about two things, 
collimation and balance. So as for the collimation, this, I get questions a lot about this. This actually holds its collimation quite well. I've been driving this thing around and I haven't noticed anything changing. Uh, it seems fine. People have concerns about this truss pole arrangement that perhaps it's sliding up and down will affect the collimation some. I haven't seen that. I have had a couple of you write in to tell me that yours do, do have to be touched up from time to time. I haven't experienced that, like I said, but I thought I would pass that along. Now, about balance. <laughs> when you have a Dobsonian, you're constantly thinking, is this thing balanced? You know, if I want to put an expensive, heavy eyepiece in the front, is it going to tip the front of this down enough? So as you saw before, I did take the stock 8x50 uh, correct image finder out, and I replaced it with this thing, which weighs next to nothing. That finder and bracket, by the way, weighs close to one pound. So just getting rid of that helps this tremendously. The other thing you might have noticed is that the stack height on the focuser is quite high like this. They do this to keep the front end of the tube shorter. And I've also had somebody tell me in the business that when your tubes are shorter, it can save on shipping costs if you can get certain dimensions below certain limits. You may have noticed from my previous review that the owner had put a weight down at the bottom of the rocker box. I've always found that to be an inelegant solution, but it does work. So there are many different options over here in the mid-sized Dobsonian market. I'm going to put some links down below that you should probably look at if you're new at this and you're thinking about buying one of these. $1,000 is getting to be somewhat serious in the price point range there. One is a link to my original review. I've also got a comparison as to whether you should buy an 8-inch or a 10-inch Dob. And there's also a comparison of all the common Dobsonians. And I'm also going to link the Celestron Star Sense Dob that I reviewed from a couple of years ago. That's a solid tube 10-inch Dob, but you do get the Star Sense functionality. And it's actually a little bit less than one of these. Okay, so what can you see with a 10-inch? Well, quite a bit. You're getting to the point now where there's so much light pollution that you're, what you can see is affected by your seeing conditions almost more than anything else. And I've often said this, the difference between an 8 and a 10, it's not like things suddenly become visible in the 10 that were invisible in the 8. A common object that I talk about is M33, the galaxy in Triangulum. I spent much of my childhood convinced that that object had been plotted incorrectly in my star atlas. It's showing this big thing, and when I look up, I don't see anything. Well, it turns out I didn't have enough aperture, and my seeing location was not very good. In an 8, on a good seeing location, you can see it. In a 10, things just get a little bit better. You can start to see the spiral arms, and I also find that your acquisition time for certain dim targets does get a little bit faster. This is, of course, at the expense of size, weight, and cost. This one has pretty good optics. The star test shows nothing to be concerned about. I have nothing to report about it. And it's a surprisingly good planetary telescope. I had this out here one night, and I was looking at Saturn. And during the course of the night, several people pulled in and said, what are you looking at? And I showed them Saturn, and we got the usual exclaims of joy and the comments saying it isn't, doesn't even look real. A Messier Marathon is easy with a telescope of this size under good sky conditions. So you know I like lots of different kinds of telescopes, but sometimes when I just want to relax, a manual daub really does fit the bill for me. It's just me, two mirrors, and the sky. Dave Quiggy referred to these things as yogurt-powered telescopes. You move the telescope, and as for the yogurt, well, you eat the yogurt. So if you want one of these telescopes, it's fine. I think you're going to be very happy with it if a mid-sized Dobsonian reflector is what you want. Having said that, let's talk about what I'm calling the elephant in the room. Should you get this flex tube tr truss design as opposed to a traditional solid tube Dobsonian like this Orion X-T10? And by the way, Skywatcher makes their own version of that, so you can decide which one you want. The solid tube version is a little bit less money. When you talk to people as to why they bought one of these, they will usually give you one of two or three reasons. And let me tell you why those reasons don't make any sense. Okay, the most common reason you'll see people for, I bought this instead of a solid tube daub, is because it saves space. Does it save space? No, not really. Let me point this out to you. So when you get this stored upright like this, they're about the same size and about the same footprint. If you lower the tube like this, it goes down about 12 to 13 inches. 
So yes, you are saving space, but you're saving it in the vertical direction where most of us don't have a problem. If we're really cramped for space, usually the footprint is what you're worried about and the footprint is the same. Both of these telescopes will fit in closets pointed straight up and you'll, use, you know, you'll lose this much space here, which you might be used to hang clothes or things, but you're really not saving all that much. One case where this could be an issue is if you have a very small car and you're carrying a passenger in the back seat. You can either lay the optical tube sideways on the seat or sometimes in a car you can actually stand it up and have a passenger in the back seat at the same time. If you don't have that situation, I'm not really sure that the space saving consideration alone is worth it. The second thing you'll, you'll hear people say is, I bought this one because it saves weight. Does it save weight? Uh, no, it doesn't. This actually weighs more than this one. So if you stop and think about it again, the 12 or 13 inches that you're saving here, you're, you're really only saving this much of rolled steel. Rolled steel of that length doesn't really weigh all that much. And in fact, by the time you put all of this mechanism in here, you know, the three truss poles and the locking mechanism, it actually weighs a little bit more. So the published weight on this telescope is actually six and a half pounds or so heavier than the traditional solid tube dog. So another reason people will give to buy one of these is that I just wanted it. I think it's cool. I think it looks neat. I want to set this thing up in the living room and sit in my easy chair and just admire it. That, my friends, is a good reason to buy it. <laughs> so there you have it. A look at the Skywatcher FlexTube 250P collapsible Dobsonian, a popular telescope for those looking for a mid-size reflector at the $1,000 price point. This is a hotly contested market and people are competing for your dollar, so a lot of these are competitive models. In the Skywatcher line alone, you can get their solid tube version for around $800 at the time of filming. This one is around $1,000, and they have a go-to version that's a couple of hundred dollars more. I've used all of them. I recommend all of them. The trick is to find the one that suits your needs and your budget. Thanks for watching. I'll see you soon.